Welcome to our Sunday service. My name is Lori Mickelson and I pastor the Nazarene Church here in Chetwin. Thank you for joining us today. Let's open in prayer. As we approach Good Friday, we do it with gratitude. We read your scripture and in that reading we see the horrific price that was paid to redeem us. We think of the true sacrifice of the season and we are grateful. There is no way we could approach your throne without that sacrifice. So Lord, let this service today draw us closer to your throne room and bring us humbly to our knees. Amen. We always celebrate Easter, but that is for Easter Sunday. There couldn't have been an Easter Sunday without a Good Friday. Easter Sunday couldn't and wouldn't exist without Good Friday. And yes, we understand that it is a God's gift for every single person on this planet. But every gift, at least every gift that is truly a gift, costs somebody something. It might be time, it might be money, but there is still a cost. Before Jesus could be raised from the dead, he had to die. And before we could accept the gift of salvation, a debt had to be paid. In order for a sacrifice to be acceptable, there had to be a cost to the person making that service. Without a cost, it would have been a nice gesture, but it wouldn't have been a sacrifice. A British playwright, John Osborne, said, the whole point of a sacrifice is that you give up something that you never really wanted in the first place. But that isn't really a sacrifice. It was on the Friday of the Passover weekend that the concept of a sacrifice would truly be understood. Jews from around the world would have gathered in Jerusalem to worship God and offer sacrifices as part of that worship. And while we might not be able to wrap our heads around the concept of animal sacrifice today, it was considered normal 2,000 years ago. On that weekend, there were lambs and pigeons that were brought to the temple and bought at the temple for the purpose of being offered to God as a sacrifice. And each of those animals cost somebody something. There were also financial offerings that were given that weekend. And regardless of how much it represented for the person who gave, that money could have been spent elsewhere on something else. So today, shortly before Easter Sunday, we're going to look at what those gifts really cost. Three years before this chapter of Jesus' story would end, it began, and the story was defined by the most memorized verse in Scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. It bears repeating, For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have a eternal life. For those of us who are parents, here is the question. Who is there in the world that you loved so much that you would willingly sacrifice one of your own children for them? So the first point is the most obvious. Friday cost the Father, his Son, the Trinity, and the nature of God is and will remain a mystery to us until our eyes are opened on the other side of eternity. But if you think about it, a God that we could explain or understand wouldn't be much of a God. I don't understand everything about my cell phone. I can't explain how it thinks it knows what I want to type when I'm texting, and I certainly don't always understand human nature and why people do the things they do. Yes, even myself. And yet, we have the desire to be able to understand and explain the greatest mystery in the universe. And we may not understand it completely, but we can understand the relationship that exists between a parent and their child. And as parents, we can understand how we feel when our child is bullied or hurt. And for some of you, you can even understand the pain of losing a child. And if you knew that your child would suffer humiliation and physical pain and separation from you, that would be heartbreaking. Even if you knew that in the end it would be all right, you simply wouldn't want your child to go through that. But that's exactly what happened on Good Friday. And God the Father's heart must have been broken when he heard his son call out from the cross the words written in Mark 15, 34. 
Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Can you imagine having your child think you had turned your back on them in their greatest time of need? But it wasn't just the father that paid a price that Friday. Friday cost the son his life, and he didn't just die peacefully in his sleep or suddenly without notice. He knew what was coming. Matthew 27, verses 11 to 26. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you? Pilate demanded. But Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during Passover to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jew Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Jesus did suffer. He suffered emotionally as the religious and political leaders lied about him and his executioners mocked him. He suffered physically through the punishment that was heaped upon him. He hung for hours under the hot sun, listening to the mocking of the crowd as he slowly and painfully suffocated. Once again, he knew it was going to happen. Matthew 20, verse 17 to 19. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. And just hours before, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had cried out to his father in Luke 22, verse 41 to 42. Jesus walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will done, not mine. But this cost goes even deeper. Think about Peter. It cost Peter his pride. Peter was Jesus' closest friend, one of the first of the twelve. Jesus confided in Peter. It was Peter who walked on the water with Jesus. It was Peter's mother-in-law who Jesus healed. And as we near the end of the Good Friday event, it was Peter who vowed that he would be there to the very end, that he would never deny Christ, and that he would willingly give up his life in defense of his best friend. And yet, at the end of the day, Peter was given three opportunities to acknowledge his relationship with Jesus, and three times he denies that he even knows who Jesus is. And as Peter denies his best friend for the third time, he turns and looks into the eyes of that very best friend. And he saw everything that he had learned and everything he had witnessed over the past three years washed away. 
How could he ever be more than a fisherman after what had happened? How could he ever be forgiven? How could he ever speak the name again of the one who he had denied in his greatest time of need? What a difference a day makes. Suddenly, Peter was a very different man than he was the day before when he pulled out a sword and tried to take on the entire group who had come to arrest Jesus. So on Good Friday, Peter represents every one of us who has ever failed in our Christian walk, who has ever denied Christ by our actions and feels deep down inside that we can never face Jesus again. And finally, Good Friday cost Jerusalem its future. The incident is recorded in Luke 19, 41 to 44. But as they came closer to Jerusalem and Jesus saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not accept your opportunity for salvation. The gospel tells us that one of the fears that sparked the religious authorities to have Jesus arrested and killed was a fear of the Romans. They were afraid of how the occupying army would view this popular young preacher and how they might react. Forty years later, the Roman armies destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And when Jesus prophesied about that event, he lays the blame at the feet of those who had rejected him. But we have to remember what happens tomorrow reflects the choices that we make today. And on that Good Friday afternoon 2,000 plus years ago, Jerusalem chose to reject the one who had come to bring peace. History tells us that Titus, the Roman general who led the destruction of Jerusalem, was offered the victor's wreath. He declined the honor, saying that he had simply served as an instrument for the wrath of God. Jesus is not simply a way to God. Jesus is the way to God. John 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so today, we remember the cost of that Friday morning 2,000 plus years ago. The cost that cost the father his son, that cost the son his life, that cost Peter his pride, and that cost those who reject reject Jesus their future. But Sunday's coming, and we will be reminded of the generous gifts of the resurrection. Let's pray. Oh, dear Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have made a way for us to experience your forgiveness and love. Thank you for having a plan for our lives and for giving us a hope for the future no matter what that future holds. Help us to always remember. Amen.
Hi, my name is David McMaster and I'm the pastor of Chetwin Fellowship Baptist Church in Chetwin, BC. It is a privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you today. I want to point you to a passage in Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, 22 to 33. Um, this is the text that I'm going to read. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to follow along. Matthew 14 says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Well into the night, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, Have courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come out to you on the water. He said, Come, and climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught a hold of him, and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those with the boat in the boat with him and said, Truly you are the Son of God. What a great story. Uh, this story has uh, many great implications for our lives, and so I'm going to highlight just a few today. I want you to notice that Jesus begins by first sending his disciples into um, the boat, while Jesus then goes off to pray, which is really important for us to see. Jesus makes it a priority to go and spend some time with the Father in prayer. And, and, um, and what Jesus does is he models the importance of prayer for us. It was Charles Spurgeon who once said that the goal of prayer is the ear of God. It is in prayer that we can build our relationship with God. It is in prayer that we can express what we're going through, the struggles and um, the hard things that we go through, the good things. We can thank Him for, for the way that He's answered prayer for us. It's in prayer that you can bring requests and God will answer, not always the way you think He will, but the, in the way that He knows is best for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, Here's a question for you. Do you spend time in prayer? Jesus modeled that as being a priority in his life. Now, while Jesus is praying, the disciples are on a boat. Matthew 24, 14, 24 says, Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. The disciples do not have smooth sailing. Uh, they are in a storm in the middle of the sea and they are struggling. And, and bear in mind that these are veteran fishermen. Like, these guys know the sea. And so you know if it's bad that if, if fish, seasoned fishermen are struggling. But Jesus sent them into a storm for a purpose. There's a reason for why they're in this. The storm was to ultimately grow and mature the disciples' faith and trust in Jesus. And at times in our lives, God will allow us to go through storms. And, and storms are simply a metaphor for some of the difficult circumstances that we go through that are out of our control but are meant to help us grow in faith. And these are often referred to as storms of perfection. And these happen regardless of whether you've done everything right in your life. Um, maybe you've been faithful to Jesus and um, you've, you've been all in on his kingdom. You're, you're doing good things for the kingdom of God. And yet you still find yourself in, in difficult situations that are beyond your control. God may use that for a purpose. Why does God allow us to go through difficulty? Well, here's the answer to strengthen your faith to build your dependence on God and to see if you really do have faith. How do you know if you have faith if it's never been tested? You don't really know until you get there. There's this verse in the book of James that says this, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let that endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. 
It's a part of our maturing as Christians that, that God allows us to go through difficult situations that, that end up testing our faith. Let's continue reading. Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. After Jesus had this time of prayer with the Father, he walks out to the disciples struggling at the sea. They have been fighting the winds and the waves all night, so I'm sure they're, they're tired and they're, they're exhausted and they're frustrated even. But look at this. Jesus shows up in probably one of the most coolest ways possible. He comes by walking on water out to the disciples in the middle of the storm, which is a miracle. No one can walk on water. That defies nature, that defies um, physics. But to quote one commentator, the waves were simply the staircase Jesus used to come to the disciples. The power of the waves were nothing compared to the power of Jesus, who's Lord over creation, who is the one who brought these waves into existence. Now look at the disciples' response. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. They didn't recognize Jesus. Why is that? Well, I think they just weren't expecting him. They weren't expecting him to come in this, in this chaos that, that they were in. And what a testament to the faithfulness of God. He shows up even when we don't expect him to. Here's a question. Do you realize or recognize Jesus showing up in difficult moments of your life? In, in the storms that you go through, do you recognize Jesus? Are you looking for Jesus in those moments? Maybe a better question is, how does Jesus show up in those moments? Well, let me give you a couple ways. First, um, Jesus has given us the promise of his Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is the, the um, third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit unites us with Christ. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a comfort and a helper and a guide. And, and so the point being is that if you are a Christian, you have the presence of God with you at all times to help you in whatever you go through, which is encouraging. Second, you also have God's written word. That the same comforting words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, you have written down in the Bible and available for you today. Jesus gives us words of, of encouragement and comfort and assurance through his word. Now look what Jesus says to his disciples. In verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them, Have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Those are some, some very comforting words. It is I. It is God. You don't need to be afraid. God is with you. Jesus is the only one who has the, the power and the authority to be able to say that. And it's a promise for you. you. You don't need to be afraid in the storms of life because God is with you. Peter responds, if it's you, command me to come out to you, walking on water. He said, come and call me out of the boat. Peter started walking on water and came towards Jesus. Notice that Peter doesn't step out of the boat having faith in himself not to sink in the water. He's not trusting his own ability to walk on water. In fact, he wouldn't be able to do. He would instantly sink. What does he say? Lord, command me to come out to you on the water. In other words, if it's your will, God, if it's, if it's your words, if it's your authority and your power, command me to come out to you. And, and Jesus says that. He says to Peter, come. And Peter steps out of the boat, focusing on Jesus and his word, which is what's keeping him afloat. But then we come to see there's a problem. When he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught hold of him and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boats, the wind ceased. What did Peter do? He shifted his focus. Even though Jesus was in full control of the whole situation, he shifted his focus on the chaotic circumstances that were around him and fear gripped his heart. Now, before we go too hard on Peter, Peter is really the one that most of us can relate to in this passage. This can so easily happen to us. It can, it can be so easy to look at our circumstances that they're out of control and then be gripped by fear. But fear really doesn't lead to anything. It doesn't accomplish anything. Jesus doesn't want us to be in fear, especially when he is present in the moment. He wants us to put our faith in him. He wants us to keep our eyes 
on him. He wants us to trust that he's in control of the situation. And if we focus on him in faith, God can do some pretty incredible things in and through us. But so often we're like Peter. We shift our focus. We look at the things that we can't control instead of the one who can control. But the good news is if, if, we, if we fail, God doesn't. When Peter failed, Jesus allowed him to sink slowly enough as a grace so that Peter could cry out, Lord, save me. His faith wasn't enough to keep his eyes on Jesus, but it was enough for him to cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And Jesus did. He reached out his arm and saved Peter. And, and the good news is we serve a God who saves. And what a great picture of the gospel. The scripture tells us that we've all fallen short and of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. We've all taken our focus off of God. And yet God in his grace and his mercy has sent Jesus to save us. He lost his own life to save us. And he went to the cross to die for our sins and resurrect to life so that we could have life. And in that, God is willing to save those who, like Peter, are willing to cry out, Lord, save me. And that's what God does. He, he grows us in our faith and our trust in him. He saves us when we fall short, which is more often than not. He constantly shows us where he is in control of situations that we didn't believe that he was in control of. Jesus got in the boat and the winds ceased. And then look at the response. And this is in verse 33. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly you are the Son of God. Jesus has the power and the authority. He truly is the Son of God, worthy of our worship, the one who can bring us through the storm. And he may test our faith along the way, but even when our faith fails, he doesn't. And, our, and we must just say, Lord, save us, and he will. And so let us keep our focus on Jesus and respond to the disciples in worship to God. Would you join me in praying? Father, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you care about our faith. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you more and more. I pray that you would guide our focus to be on you in any storm or situation that is out of our control. I pray that when we go through difficult things, that we would recognize that you are with us, that your Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guide, a helper, and a sustainer. We thank you for the promises that you've given us in your word. Would your Holy Spirit bring them to mind often? Lord, we love you. For it's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.